Hello everyone. As part of our initiatives webinar series, I'd like to thank you for joining us online today for this very special live broadcast. My name is Emily Eberly with SACS Communications and I am your technical producer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Liberation from Mechanical Ventilation, Can Telehealth Help Expedite? And now I'd like to introduce you to Michael Gentile, who is our moderator today. Mike Gentile is an associate in research at Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. He has been involved with clinical practice, research, and teaching related to critical care medicine for nearly three decades. Mike is a fellow of the AARC and the ACCM. He has published numerous abstracts, manuscripts, and textbooks chapters. Michael, welcome, and I'm so glad to be working with you for this special session, and we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people around the world today. Are you ready to get started? Yes, Emily, thank you for that kind introduction. Good morning or afternoon to everyone, depending on your location. The title of today's webinar is Liberation from Mechanical Ventilation. Can Telehealth Help Expedite? We are very fortunate to have two extremely qualified speakers today presenting on a very important and timely topic. Our first speaker, John Davies, is a colleague of mine here at Duke University. John is a registered respiratory therapist and clinical research coordinator at Duke University Medical Center here in Durham, North Carolina. John's research interests are related to adult critical care. John is also the co-chair of the Mechanical Ventilation Simulation Committee for the American College of Chest Physicians. John has published on a, a number of papers in various journals and has presented at numerous medical conferences, both nationally and internationally. Our second speaker, Sean Valenta, is also a registered respiratory therapist. Sean is the director of telehealth at the Medical University of South Carolina, MUSC Health in Charleston, South Carolina. Sean oversees the strategic initiatives and operations of MUSC's Health Center for Telehealth. In this position, he has managed the operations of telehealth services that range from ICU to home, including a 26 hospital telestroke network and is one of the fastest growing school-based telehealth networks in the country. Sean has also worked collaboratively in statewide strategic planning and furthering the health of South Carolinians with telehealth technology through the formation of South Carolina Telehealth Alliance. The speakers have uh, the following disclosures. John Davies has an advisory board to disclose and Sean does not have any uh, disclosures today. Very important is this educational activity is approved for one contact hour um, through for nurses and respiratory therapists. At the end of this webinar, there'll be a, uh, a link and this webinar is supported uh, by a grant from Medtronic. So with all the introductions done, we'll now turn it over to our presenters. John, are you ready? I am. Thank you, Mike, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, my name is John Davis. I do work at Duke University Medical Center. Um, I'll be talking about the liberation from mechanical ventilation and, and what's currently available to us uh, in most or all centers. Okay, so the learning objectives for today, uh, I'm going to talk about the evidence relating to the use of spontaneous breathing trials. And then I'll also discuss the evidence and the role of automated weaning. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Sean. He's going to talk about opportunities where telehealth can standardize and improve compliance of ventilator weaning protocols and how telehealth can help disseminate current best practices for liberation from mechanical ventilation. <clears throat> So when we talk about liberation or weaning, we commonly use the term weaning. Um, weaning describes a gradual process of removing support to allow the respiratory system to handle spontaneous respiration. Liberation, on the other hand, implies a rapid removal of assistance that is no longer needed. And in reality, the, the vast majority of patients fall into this latter category. Um, I, I like to uh, repeat the quote that uh, Dean has told me uh, some time ago. He said, we need to be weaned from weaning. So um, 
so I'll be using the term liberation probably more often than weaning. So when we consider when to um, consider liberation, we have to consider a couple of things. The first is the load, respiratory load on the patient, so the lung disease, cardiovascular dysfunction, chest wall issues, um, and how that balances out with what the respiratory capacity of the patient is. And things that contribute to a diminished capacity include muscle weakness, diminished respiratory drive, impaired neuromuscular function. So the, the real challenge here is to identify when the capacity outweighs the load and when we can uh, consider liberation. <clears throat> so around 1999, um, there was an evidence-based review board uh, out of McMaster University that performed a, a comprehensive review of, of all the issues uh, involving vent weaning. And then shortly thereafter, <clears throat> a task force with the American College of Chest Physicians, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and the AARC, um, th there was a task force organized, and they were charged with developing 12 evidence-based recommendations um, that ended up getting published in CHEST in 2001. And <clears throat> There are 12 guidelines. I am not. I don't have time to go through all of them here. Um, I'm going to talk about the four that are most relevant to the today's topic, and that is how to identify the potential uh, potential patients for liberation in your ICU, um, how to assess for liberation, and then how to differentiate between liberation and extubation, and in, in that that they're not the same thing. And then what do you do if the liberation attempt fails? And the other guidelines pertain to things like uh, anesthesia, uh, sedation practice, and prolonged weaning, which uh, is uh, I don't have time to go into today. So the first thing you should do with your patient is something called a wean screen. So you identify a patient with some uh, that, that can have potential reversible causes and look at their oxygenation, are they adequately oxygenated? And these are just kind of some rough guidelines, but a PF ratio of one, greater than 150, a uh, PEEP of, you know, 5 to 8, uh, FiO2, you know, 40%, 50%, and then a pH above 7.25. Um, they also need to be stable hemodynamically, um, no active ischemia, and they shouldn't be on uh, vasopressors of more than 5 mics per kilogram per minute. Um, they obviously must be able to initiate an inspiratory effort. Uh, usually uh, sedation is stopped, and there uh, should be no planned surgical procedures if you're going to consider weaning. <clears throat> so some of the things that you've probably heard over the years um, that people use to assess the potential for liberation, or I guess at the time for some of these it was still uh, weaning, um, Miniventilation, there's a 20 studies that pertain to that. Uh, negative inspiratory force maneuver, uh, something called the crop index, respiratory rate, uh, tidal volume, uh, rapid shallow breathing index, core, um, and then integrated weaning index. So there's, and you can see the crop, core, and uh, integrated weaning index down at the bottom. They tend to uh, incorporate compliance and oxygenation amongst some other things. Um, but these parameters um, are probably better at determining the cause of respiratory failure than predicting successful liberation. Uh, probably the two that are the most uh, predictive would be the respiratory rate and the rapid shallow breathing index during unassisted breathing. Um, these parameters are more predictive in the populations as opposed to individuals, so they're not really recommended to be used routinely by themselves. So if the wean screen is passed, what do you do? Um, according to the guidelines, the next thing you should do is assess whether or not um, the patient can continue on spontaneous breathing for a, a formal tests. So an in initial brief period of spontaneous breathing can be used to assess the capability of continuing on with a formal spontaneous breathing trial. <clears throat> so, so, you know, you. We talk about tolerance criteria. How do you know if the patient is failing, <clears throat> excuse me, or succeeding? And that involves close uh, clinical observation during the screening phase. If the patients fail, you, you usually 
see it fairly rapidly. Um, you see muscle fatigue, so paradoxical movement, hemodynamic instability, their heart rate goes up, blood pressure probably would go up, uh, discomfort, they just look uncomfortable, they may be diaphoretic, and then obviously signs of worsening gas exchange. However, if the screen looks good, you proceed on to the formal spontaneous breathing trial of 30 minutes to two hours. And where did that come from? And this is a study from Andreas Esteban back in the mid-1990s, uh, and he compared daily spontaneous breathing trials to IMV and pressure support weans, which were both being used at the time. And this was a prospective randomized control trial, uh, a multicenter trial of 546 patients. <clears throat> and what they found, if you look at, the, this is the uh, IMV line, and this is the probability of successful weaning here. This is IMV, this is pressure support, this is a once a day spontaneous breathing trial, and these are uh, repeated spontaneous breathing trials. But they found that spontaneous breathing trials led to extubation more quickly, three times more quickly than IMV, and two times more quickly than pressure support. And that resulted in median duration of weaning uh, in the IMV group of five days, the pressure support wean of four days, and then three days for the spontaneous breathing trial. So this is what the um, McMaster group and the uh, task force uh, based the recommendation for spontaneous breathing trials on. So the controversy in our institution, and I'm sure many others, is which way, what's the best way to do a spontaneous breathing trial? Um, there's conflicting evidence as to which one is the best. Uh, people use T pieces, uh, standalone CPAP, low levels of pressure support, automated automatic tube compensation. Um, there is a I'll talk about this a little bit later in my talk. Um, there's more recent uh, uh, guidelines that actually recommend perhaps using low levels of pressure support as the best method, uh, but the evidence is not real strong. <clears throat> so. You get this patient, and if the patient pass, passes the spontaneous breathing trial, do you extubate them right away? Well, you have to assess some other things, and that's usually where the multidisciplinary team comes together. Um, they, the patient still needs to be assessed for can they maintain airway patency? Have they got an adequate cough? Uh, what are their secretion amounts like? If they're having to be suctioned more than every two hours, chances are if you extubate them, they're going to require reintubation shortly after. Um, alertness is not necessarily a prerequisite. You know, these patients don't have to be sitting up in their bed, you know, doing the New York Times crossword um, to be extubated. Um, you know, we sometimes talk about the Glasgow Coma Scale. Um, it's a little difficult to calculate in intubated patients, and there's no standard definition of alertness. But I think if the above three things, if those conditions are met, uh, if they have an adequate cough, they can protect their airway and the secretions are not an issue, that chances are that it will be a successful extubation. <clears throat> so then, what, what do you do if the spontaneous breathing trial is a failure? And the first thing, and these are again from the guidelines, the first thing is to search for reversible causes. Is there something that we haven't totally reversed that can be uh, you know, reversed for the next spontaneous breathing trial, and repeat the spontaneous breathing trial in 24 hours, and again, you're going to do your wean screen, make sure that they're clinically stable. Um, in between spontaneous breathing trials, provide stable lung protective ventilation that is comfortable. Um, there's few data that suggest that a gradual pressure support reduction um, or any type of other reduction, um, IMV for instance, actually reduces ventilator length of stay. It probably adds to ventilator length of stay be and it wastes resources and, and risks patient fatigue. So I think putting them back on a comfortable level and then trying them again the next day is the best way to go. And <clears throat> so there are some modes out there that will automatically wean the patient. Um, I'm going to talk about the two most uh, common ones. The first one is called adaptive support ventilation. Available on the Hamilton ventilators, it uses adaptive pressure in both mandatory and spontaneous breaths and targets 
minute, minute ventilation, tidal volume, and respiratory rate based on ideal body weight, and you also set the percentage of minute ventilation that you want the ventilator to deliver. So if you set what it predicts as 100, then the patient may not be doing much spontaneous breathing, but if you set it below 100, the patient generally has to pick up some of that breathing, and how do they do it? They do spontaneous breaths in pressure support. Um, but you do, do need to set it in a way that if you, you know, if you are weaning this patient, you can use this mode in to totally support the patient if you'd like, but in the weaning uh, mode, you want to set the minute ventilation so that it's going to encourage some spontaneous breathing. It's been studied more often in cardiac surgery, um, uh, not so much with patients with pure respiratory failure, but there are some studies out there that I will go through. <clears throat> And the first I want to touch on is by Chen uh, back in 2011. He uh, looked at 79 patients in a single 16-bed ICU, compared uh, adaptive support ventilation versus a gradual pressure support wean, and um, that showed that ASV actually shortened um, mechanical ventilation discontinuation time. Um, I would like to point out that the clinician to patient ratio in this particular ICU was 1 to 16. So um, the, patient, the clinician may not have uh, been able to be at the bedside in a timely manner. So that's where may, ASV may have had some advantages here. Another study out of in the European Respiratory Journal looked at COPD patients and he compared the same ASV versus a gradual pressure support wean. Um, and they showed shorter weaning times, but no difference in ICU length of stay. I'm not sure what the clinician to patient ratio was in that study, um, but certainly seemed to have a little bit of a benefit in terms of weaning times anyway. The other one that's out there is Smart Care. Uh, Smart Care is on the uh, dragger ventilators, and it you adjusts the pressure support level based on the patient's tidal volume, respiratory rate, and end tidal CO2. Uh, the clinician enters the patient weight and ET tube size and type, and whether the patient may have a uh, COPD-like condition or a neurologic condition. Um, and depending on what they input, it adjusts the algorithm uh, to provide uh, lung protective ventilation. And it generally adjusts the pressure support to maintain a tidal volume of greater than 300, a respiratory rate of greater than 12 and uh, less than 30 and an end tidal CO2 of less than 55. So here's, here's some of the literature on smart care. Um, the first is uh, done in 2006. It's a multi-center randomized controlled trial in 144 patients, smart care versus usual practice. Um, and it was basically physician decision um, not protocolized. Smart care reduced weaning by two days and total time on mechanical ventilation by 4.5 days. We'll point out that when you look at these studies, it's important to consider the control group because if they're not well matched, especially in a multi-center trial with each other, it's difficult to say that it was actually the intervention uh, that reduced weaning time. Um, another study in a couple years later in Australia use smart care versus uh, controlled ventilation in uh, well-staffed ICU actually found a delay in identification of readiness with the automated system. And then a study back in 2012, 300 surgical ICU patients found no difference between smart care and the standard weaning protocol. There was a subgroup analysis that did show that it may have some benefit in uh, patients that underwent cardiac surgery. So we really don't know whether it, um, these automated modes actually do speed up uh, liberation. Here's, here's another study, a more recent one. This one was 70 patients, smart care versus a therapist-driven protocol. And in this one, the weaning time was actually almost double in the smart care group. So I think it brings to light that where these things may, these modes may have an advantage is in centers that might have limited staffing. Um, they may not, they, because they both do a gradual pressure support wean, they may not have advantages uh, in a well-staffed unit. We just don't know. So this is a meta-analysis done uh, two years ago, I guess, uh, looking at automated versus non-automated weaning. 
They included 21 trials, 1,676 participants, and they concluded that uh, weaning time was reduced with mixed or medical ICU populations and smart care, uh, but not surgical populations or other systems. There was no strong evidence of effect on mortality rate, length of stay, reintubation rates, self-extubation, or the use of non-invasive ventilation. Uh, seemed to be some advantage in prolonged ventilation um, with the automated system. So uh, it's, it's really difficult to tell whether or not it has a, a meaningful impact because um, there was a substantial heterogeneity in the trials, meaning that there was a lot of different populations. Uh, control the control arms were different in different studies, so it's it's difficult to take you know uh, a firm conclusion from this. But it did identify that it may res the automated closed loop systems may result in a de decreased dur duration of weaning, uh, mechanical ventilation, and ICU stay. Um, but again, uh, heterogeneity and uh, you know the evidence is still rather limited, so it's it's difficult to draw a conclusion. Um, but in some situations, it may have advantages. So I would say to conclude with automated weaning is that uh, you know the role of closed loop systems is still uncertain. Uh, may be helpful in routine patients without significant comorbidities. Um, it may be helpful in ICUs with limited staffing and expertise. Um, what another thing it may do is reduce practice variation. So if you get, you know, these rogue physicians and they want to do it their way and, you know, you put them in an automated weaning mode, you're going to do it, end up doing it the same way and not have these different practices. But it's still, the, this automated modes still do not obviate the need for careful assessment or of readiness for extubation. So here's a, a, a task force consensus that came out of Europe uh, in 2007. Um, and these were the main points that came out. Consider weaning as soon as possible, same as the 2001 uh, consensus. Spontaneous breathing trial, the major diagnostic test, the same. Uh, normalized support in between spontaneous breathing trials, that's the same. And consider non-invasive ventilation only in selected patients. That's something that was new because non-invasive was rapidly growing at that time, especially in COPD patients. And here's some uh, recommendations that came out last year, um, the differences, the, as I mentioned earlier, the initial spontaneous breathing trial could be, or could maybe should be conducted with an inspiratory pressure augmentation of five to eight centimeters of water. You know, they considered a weak recommendation with moderate quality evidence. They did suggest using protocols attempting to minimize sedation. Again, weak uh, recommendation with a low quality of evidence. Probably the biggest one is recommend extubation to preventative non-invasive ventilation for patients at high risk for extubation failure who have passed an SBT. That's a strong recommendation, and this is your, you know, hypercapnic patients, the COPD population is, is what they're targeting here. Um, but they did recommend using uh, uh, pressure support, you know, five to eight. Um, but again, the, the it's a weak recommendation with moderate quality evidence. So in summary, um, wean screens should be done on a regular basis to identify patients ready for to undergo a spontaneous breathing trial. The spontaneous breathing trial should be done once a day in patients that pass, pass the wean screen. If it if spontane, in between spontaneous breathing trials, a comfortable amount of support should be used. And this, again, slow pressure support weans may actually delay extubation and waste clinician time. The automated systems, they may be useful in certain situations, limited staffing, um, but I think that in a well-staffed ICU with uh, standardized weaning protocols, that's probably the way to go. But again, the automated weaning systems may have a role uh, with limited um, staffing and perhaps in prolonged uh, weaning situations. So I like to show this slide at the end because I was around for that first point, the history of weaning. We didn't have IMV. We had a control mode, and when we deemed the patient might be ready, we just put them on a cool misc, mist. Sorry. Um, then we had IMV. We had to build the H frame because it was not synchronized, and we had to provide some method for the patient to breathe spontaneously. And then we had SIMV with a systematic reduction in ventilator rate. Uh, and then we had SIMV with pressure support. Um, 
with the idea being we reduced the rate until the patient uh, breathed spontaneously all the time. Then we had pressure support. Now we're, we have those automated modes, pressure control, pressure support. We're not sure where their role is yet. And now, but with the spontaneous breathing trial being the gold standard, it's almost like we're back to square one. Just take them off and let them breathe spontaneously. So with that, um, I just would like to finish off by saying that, um, you know, I've kind of covered some tools that we have presently on our ventilators to hopefully expedite weaning. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Sean. Sean's going to be talking about a potential, another potential tool um, that may have the ability to further expedite weaning, especially in areas where there may be limited staffing, and uh, that's telehealth. So Sean, over to you, man. Thanks, John. I uh, appreciate that for the informative overview of ventilator weaning and liberation. In this next section of the presentation, we will begin to examine how telehealth may be a new tool uh, in a toolkit. And what we'll do is, is we'll identify opportunities where telehealth can standardize and improve compliance of ventilator weaning protocols. And we'll also describe how telehealth can help disseminate current best practices for liberation from mechanical ventilation. So I think at first it's important to understand really what telemedicine telehealth is. So telemedicine, kind of the uh, textbook uh, definition, is the use of medical information exchanged from one site to another via electronic communications to improve a patient's clinical health status. So really, you know, using technology uh, to deliver healthcare over distance is kind of a general term. And we look at telehealth a little bit more broadly of that. So it's inclusive of telemedicine, but also includes uh, using, you know, video conferencing, other, uh, you know, electronic communication means for health research and also healthcare education. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide because uh, really telehealth provides a very broad spectrum. Um, you know, from anywhere from the home into the ICU. So if you look to the left, you know, we talk about, you know, healthcare now being able to be delivered into the home, you know, using smartphones, laptops. Uh, there's a, a huge uh, thing going on, national trend with, you know, what's called a direct-to-consumer telehealth. So examples of this is, you know, you could be a patient, uh, you snap a, a picture of, of your, your red eye one morning and send it into your uh, physician via your phone and, you know, they can diagnose you with pink eye and, and call prescriptions into a, a local pharmacy, you know, if needed. So this is, you know, a good use to handle simple conditions uh, and, and there's more use of this uh, kind of evolving telehealth about how do we use this for chronic conditions as well. Uh, shifting over uh, is also kind of more into the home is using telehealth for remote monitoring. There's been a lot of success uh, with congestive heart failure patients, uh, using telehealth remote monitoring for diabetic patients, helping control A1C levels. And now we're also seeing remote monitoring in uh, in-home in regards to COPD patients and how we can use that kind of tool to uh, reduce readmissions uh, back to the hospital. Uh, in the middle of the screen, you see a child there who's receiving school-based telehealth. So this offers, you know, children to be able to be in, the, in their schools who might have difficulty with uh, access to care in their communities, uh, specifically in rural and medically underserved communities. And with this, we can use telehealth technologies uh, such as electronic stethoscopes to auscultate a child's lungs 100, 200 miles away, uh, use other types of telehealth peripheral um, equipment to diagnose ear infections, uh, and it's also been used to um, help control chronic diseases like asthma uh, and, and helping with mental health. ADHD uh, is, is a big issue in, in schools today. Uh, one of the things we're using now is uh, piloting Bluetooth enabled inhalers. So with this, uh, these Bluetooth inhalers actually send data on how often uh, a rescue med might be used. And now we're starting to look at um, controller meds as well. So if you think about that, you know, you start seeing this data being coming in and being collected um, and you can start to prioritize, you know, how you're interacting with children. If you're seeing someone using the rescue med more often, you could then intervene in the home and kind of find out what's going on. Or if you find out that they're not using their controller med daily, you can intervene, find out what's going on. Did they not get a, a prescription fulfilled? Did they not understand how they're supposed to use their medication? Uh, really helping, you know, con control, you know, uh, you know, the population with this and, and be able to educate better of our patients. 
Uh, shifting over, uh, cart-based solution is kind of more what people traditionally think of or view as when they think of telehealth. Uh, you'll see these in hospitals, uh, for example, of you know telestroke, um, being able to bring in an expert stroke uh, specialist to a hospital to treat a patient with stroke symptoms, and within minutes being able to uh, see a CT image sent through the cloud and being able to diagnose and, and properly recommend to the emergency medicine physician if they should give TPA or not. Uh, they're being uh, deployed into physician practices, bringing specialty care into primary care settings, um, making sure that you know patients don't have to travel a couple hours to see specialists in, in the more urban settings. Uh, and also now a, a new thing of more putting them into skilled nursing facilities and, and jails, helping avoid uh, readmissions, uh, avoidable readmissions uh, into the emergency room or into the hospitals. And then finally, uh, which we're going to talk a little bit more today about, is tele-ICU, the more, uh, in a more robust setting. So first, telehealth is it a new idea. Uh, not really. This is Science and Invention magazine. This is back in 1925. Uh, the editor uh, kind of made this illustration called what he called the radio doctor. And during that time, uh, the editor, he envisioned that in the future, physicians would be able to take care of their patients using you know, radio waves from a distance. So not too far off from, from common, you know, I think he was on the right path, but of course we've had a, a lot of advancement since then. So to give a little bit of background and history of telemedicine and telehealth, it's, uh, there's all kinds of different points in history that you can, you can actually look to. I just pulled out a couple that I think uh, uh, provide a little bit more significance. Uh, the first one being in 1948, transmission of radiological images uh, by telephone lines in Pennsylvania. Uh, this was actually the first example of an electronic medical record transfer. This was done just between two points about 24 miles away. In 1959, uh, two-way interactive television was used to uh, transmit neurological examination in Nebraska. And this was actually the, the first, they were the first to use video communications for medical purposes. So 1963, this is the one kind of a lot of people look at is more the modern day telehealth. Uh, in Massachusetts General, they established a telecommunications link with the medical station that was, was staffed by a nurse 24 uh, hours a day connecting um, the Boston Logan's Airport with Mass General, a physician there. They were using a two-way microwave audio video link to, to treat uh, traveling patients uh, from the airport. But it wasn't until the 1960s, 1970s, where you really started to see uh, telehealth expand. And, and that was because NASA got behind it. They, they, they put a lot of funds behind uh, researching, um, you know, telehealth. Because they were, you know, if you think about it, you know, they were sending astronauts into space. There was, a, there was a lot of stuff going on with NASA at that time. And they were really interested in how they could remotely monitor uh, their astronauts in space. So just, you know, collecting data on, on, on heart rate and different things like that. Uh, and they started making other investments of working with uh, Indian reservations, and these become some of the first kind of remote populations um, utilizing telehealth. So where are we now? Uh, some people say we finally caught up to the Jetsons, and uh, some younger viewers may not recognize this, but this the Jetsons was actually a cartoon from back in the 1960s, and it was kind of taking place in the future. So back then, uh, this was actually Elroy Jetson. He was, he was sick at home, trying to get off from school, told his mom he was sick, and she said, let's call the doctor. Hit a button, and all of a sudden, she had the uh, family physician video conferencing into the home to diagnose Elroy. So this, this is what you would call that direct-to-consumer telehealth, and, and this is actually happening, happening right now. So what are some of the benefits of telehealth? You know, when I... Uh, when I was in grad school, you know, I learned a lot about the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement's triple aim, which which really looks about you know you know lowering costs and, and, and improving quality and increasing access. And what we learned at that time is it was pretty much impossible. I was actually told to have any type of healthcare initiative which positively affected all three of these angles. That, and, and if you think about it, it kind of made sense specifically at that time that if you did anything, any type of healthcare initiative that improved quality and increased access, it was likely going to cost more. 
And if you did anything that was going to reduce cost, it was probably going to have a negative effect on quality or access. Well, I'm happy to say that you know, telehealth has been one of the first things that have been proven when used appropriately um, can actually lower costs, improve quality, and increase access. So telehealth in the ICU, better known as tele-ICU, you know, really what is it? Remote monitoring of, of ICU patients, uh, usually done on a 24-7 basis. Uh, it should be really considered a second layer of support for the bedside staff. So not replacing any frontline staff, but being a, a second layer of support. Um, Tele-ICU providers can include uh, physician intensivists, uh, advanced practice providers such as nurse practitioners or physician assistants, critical care nurses, uh, and respiratory therapists. Um, and actually even some TELASU uh, models have started to include a pharmacist to assist with med management. So some of the goals regarding TELASU, um, really trying to reduce mortality, reduce ICU and hospital length of stay, improve compliance with best practice, you really start to have standardization in the care that we uh, utilize for our patients, reducing ventilator days, improving patient safety, and hopefully also reducing complications. So telehealth, how can it help expedite liberation from mechanical ventilation? Well, I think by, by doing that, you have to really look at what are some of our potential barriers to, to liberation. And John, you know, he hit on a lot of these different things. Uh, you know, a lack of standardization. You know, unfortunately, we have a lot of variability uh, in the way we treat our patients, and that can be from hospital to hospital. It could be within one hospital. You know, you have different physicians uh, with different care plans. You have different levels of experience and skill level with your, you know, your respiratory therapists and your RNs at the bedside. Uh, poor adherence to best practice. You know, we. How often have you heard that? Once something is proven to be evidence-based best practice, uh, that it may take 10 to up to 15 years of a delay before that is completely applied, you know, as commonplace, you know, throughout our country. And physician availability, you know, you heard John talk about, you know, direct observation, um, and I, I even mentioned about, you know, RT uh, clinician to patient ratios of 1 to 16. You know, um, you know, to be able to have people, you know, directly observing patients as they're weaning and preparing for extubation can be a, a huge thing. And, and how many of uh, your organizations will actually will not extubate after, quote, unquote, after hours? You know, you have someone that starts on an event, you hope to maybe extubate them by that afternoon, and, uh, you know, you, you try one last time at 3 or 4 p.m., and it doesn't work. They were probably pretty close, and they say, you know what, we'll, we'll try again in the morning. You know, and unfortunately, we should be you know, making sure that we're doing these things on a 24-7 basis. So we'll take a little bit deeper dive into TELICU and, and how that's operated. So it's, you know, TELICU really looks at a continuous access to patient-level data for intervention and real-time emergency management. And, and to understand really what that is, it provides continuous vital sign monitoring and EMR feed. So providers in the operations center have actually a live feed of, of vital signs, and they have access to the electronic health record at, at that specific hospital. And this provides the healthcare providers within the operations center to see labs, uh, see images of you know, CT scans, chest x-rays, and have the ability to you know, enter orders and also complete clinical documentation. In addition to that, you know, the providers have the ability to connect to the partnering hospital with two-way audio and visual communications. So, you know, they can call the uh, physician, you know, from the operation center into the room, and they can say, hey, meet me in room two. Uh, and it could be to take another second look at a patient. They have maybe a question. They want to have a, you know, consult. Maybe it's a physician who wants to consult with the physician in the operation center. It could be as simple as uh, it's at nighttime and a family member has, really wants to talk to a doctor and, there, and there's, there's no one around. Um, from, from that all the way to as high as being able to run a, uh, a cardiac arrest. Um, most LSU uh, operations have set up in the room where you have an emergency button where if someone uh, goes into a code, you can actually hit that button and within less than a minute, a physician is able to camera into that room, you know, find out is there any physician in the room, 
not, they'll take over and run the code until a physician can get there. Sometimes they can collaborate often where, you know, they can be that extra eyes running a code while maybe the second physician who gets there needs to put in some type of central line uh, or something like that. So we'll look at a couple of recent studies on, on tele-ICU care. And the first study was one that kind of used a combination of tele-ICU but also structured ventilator rounds. Uh, this was uh, a study with 11 hospitals. Uh, the ICU size ranged anywhere from 8 to 28 bed uh, units. And they really wanted to focus on you know, best practice adherence to low tidal volume, uh, ventilator duration ratio, you know, really how long they're on the vent and trying to get them off quicker, and ICU mortality ratio. So what they did in regards to what the intervention focused on was they developed ventilator round checklist that created a structured process, uh, had an assessment of low tidal volume ventilation, making sure that you're really using you know, predicted body weight and, and appropriately setting uh, your tidal volume, and making sure you had daily structured uh, assessment of extubation. You know, which included looking at ABGs, secretion productions, your sedation levels, like I mentioned, the appropriately uh, uh, set tidal volumes, and your PF ratios. And the results showed that uh, for this study, there was actually an improved adherence to low tidal volume strategy. The patients were actually able to get off of the vents quicker, so their ventilator duration ratio actually reduced by 16%. Uh, one of the significant thing, but actually not surprising, is there was an extremely wide variability of care between all the hospitals of, of how they treated their patients. Um, and unfortunately, no statistical, statistical significance change of ICU length of stay nor hospital mortality with this study. Second, we'll look at actually the largest or one of the largest tele-ICU studies done to date. Uh, this included um, over 100,000 adult patients spanning 56 ICUs and 32 hospitals. And they really focused on you know, the large things of mortality and length of stay. So the interventions that they put in place were uh, improved adherence to ICU best practices. You know, think about it you know, in regards to ventilator bundles. Um, how often have we, you know, we we worked on different initiatives to improve your ventilator bundles and your compliance with that. And, and usually when you dedicate time to that, you know, you, you get some high, you know, 95% or, or greater, hopefully 100% compliance. Um, and then often priorities shift to another initiative. And then usually you start to see compliance lag. You know, tele-ICUs have had extremely a lot of success with um, making sure that there's some good best practice, um, adherence to these best practices. And you often see, you know, 98 to 100% compliance. Um, with a lot of those um, pieces. Uh, reduce response times to alarms, and also they encourage the use of performance data, specifically using Apache scoring data. So the results of this were uh, very significant. So actually, they were able to decrease ICU length of stay by 20%, decrease hospital length of stay by 15%, uh, ICU survival actually increased 26%, and hospital survival increased 16%. So think about it, they were, they were getting patients out of the ICU quicker, they were getting patients out of the hospital quicker, and more people you know, were surviving, more people were living because of it. So some of the tele-ICU uh, opportunities uh, that are available, um, one of the biggest opportunities I think where telehealth can have an impact is you know, patient safety and quality improvement. You know, how, do we improve, how do we improve compliance and really reduce variability of care? Multidisciplinary peer-to-peer -peer education. You know, we're doing this with our tele-ICU program of collaborating between partnering hospitals, and it's not just at the physician level, and that's involved, but it's also from a nurse to nurse. You know, a nurse in the operation center connecting with a maybe a rural hospital or community hospital, where maybe the community hospital nurse might not want to have to you know call a physician at night. They just have a question, you know, they want to ask you know about a specific patient. They can have that dialogue, connecting RT to RT, pharmacy to pharmacy, um, and, and you know, really sharing best practices. And, and that kind of gets into the next point of you know, developing protocols and Im implementing them of best practices in this larger collaboration of group. Um, and one probably maybe one of the most important is you know, clinical case study reviews. You know, we're doing this here in South Carolina where um, you know, kind of through this consortium of this tele network of reviewing cases 
and, and learning the lessons learned and not just from the larger systems um, but to some of the smaller hospitals as well and how do we sh share that knowledge to uh, improve care you know across the board so I, I really do believe that telehealth does have the potential uh, to help expedite liberation from mechanical ventilation I think when you look at you know standardization and, and care plans awakening trials you know, the formal assessments, the, the wean screens that John talked about, you know, and making sure spontaneous breathing trials are completed and appropriately evaluated. Um, it could be a helpful tool. I think it could be a helpful tool in disseminating best practice, you know, making sure it's not just, you know, coming to the academic medical center, but once things are, 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 are you know, you start to see in Evans-based medicine and you start seeing the literature out there, um, how do we disseminate that better to, to maybe more local, smaller community hospitals? And having uh, availability, um, you know, we talked about that, you know, direct observation during screening, you know, um, you know, having the ability to, to be able to camera in, you know, and, and, and have maybe a therapist who might be putting on a lot of different patients uh, on different trials and, and can't be watching every one. But to have that second layer being able to say, you know what, you know, bed two looks like they're not doing good. Let's, let's maybe take them off. Um, or be able to communicate that and be able to see things because, um, you, you know, let's face it, respiratory therapists don't always have time to be able to put them on a trial and sit there and watch the whole time because they've got maybe six to eight or even more patients that need to be put on trials. And really, you know, extubating as soon as that patient passes criteria. So if you have the ability, no matter what time of day it is, whether it's 10 in the morning or 10 at night, um, if the patient's ready, we should be extubating as soon as possible. And finally, and I think it's important to note that a full tele-IC model, you know, it, it might not be feasible for all organizations, you know, but even in the absence of a, a formal tele-IC program, having the ability to remotely, you know, view the ventilator and having direct observation of the spontaneous breathing trial could lead to similar, you know, uh, improved patient outcomes. And that, that concludes my portion of the presentation and at this time you know we'll open it up for questions and I'll pass the controls back over to our moderator Michael. Well thank you both John and Sean for excellent presentations. We've gotten a whole bunch of uh, great questions in here and we'll get to them in a minute. All right some very important housekeeping items here. You go to the saxtesting.com um, slash uh, INIT website, you'll need to register for the test site and upon uh, completion you'll be able to print your certificate and then you'll be able to get your uh, CEUs for this event. So now what I'll do is I'm going to go through, we've got lots of great questions here and in the interest in time I'll try and <clears throat> excuse me, get through as many as I can. Um, and so some of these are both go back and forth to John and also to Sean, and we'll we'll ask them. And um, it's interesting because people have questions not only about mechanical ventilation but also about um, about the telehealth. And the first question is for you, Sean: Is what is is there any staffing changes that happen with telehealth uh, versus a, another? Uh, model. Yeah, um, and I think that's that's important to note that um, in regards to frontline staff should not change. You know, this should this is not replace in-person care. So the staffing models uh, should not change. Now we do know there's variability of staffing models uh, within hospitals, um, and and there there should be you know standards in regards to clinician versus you know ventilators. You hear a lot about that but it should not replace in-person care. It should be looked at as that second layer of care. Okay. <clears throat> and I'll have uh, one for John. And because uh, medicine is basically a bunch of acronyms and words we use together, is can we use liberation uh, and the wean screen, are they uh, synonymous words? Can we use them interchangeably? Um. Well, the wean screen is identifying patients that are uh, at that have the potential to be liberated. The liberation actually means free from the mechanical ventilator. So, um, the first step in that is, is of course, it, that, that wean screen where you're looking at the patient, making sure they're clinically stable, 
and then if they are, then you would proceed to the next step to uh, assess for uh, the potential for liberation. So it's kind of a three-step uh, process. The first one is looking for potential patients through the wean screen, assessing that they may their liberation potential, and then the last step is deciding whether or not they can be extubated. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, Sean, we've gotten a couple questions from folks um, about uh, cost and reimbursement. Um, can you uh, reply a little bit about um, the cost model and then does is this more of a lucrative market uh, that can can be a um, an issue? Yeah, sure. That's a good. That's a great question. So traditionally, when people think about tele ICU, it is the kind of 24/7 operation center um, being that second layer. So uh, professional billing is actually not submitted. So this is um, kind of a, a contract with the hospital, uh, and where the I guess the return on investment comes is uh, there's a lot of different no notions to this. Uh, physicians or hospitals have a better job of recruiting physicians, knowing that. Uh, they've got this layer of support. Um, also, in regards to call, uh, nursing turnover has been proven to decrease, um, having you know more satisf satisfaction. And also, in regards to the quality aspects of things. So, um, if we look at South Carolina, um, we have six uh, partnering hospitals in our network. Um, we looked at actual versus predicted mortality, and tell us you in South Carolina potentially saved over 140 lives just last year alone. Um, so there's a lot of different things like that in regards to decreasing length of stay, improving your throughput uh, throughout the ICU that uh, shows a lot of um, return on investment. But it's not just one thing you can point to. Uh, it's a lot of components that kind of add up to that. Uh, but it's something that's still being studied because tele ICU uh, is an, can be an expensive model if it's a robust model, um, but there are some uh, more scaled down versions of it. All right, thank you. Um, we have a question from Jeff that says, with the advancement in software technology available today, by alerting the clinicians when a patient may be ready to wean, do you see any need where the system may be helpful in the future uh, to help the, the therapist wean sooner in, in sort of this model? Um, I, you know, the automated modes, the smart care actually will uh, let the clinician know that uh, they, it considers the patient ready for a spontaneous breathing trial, and um, I believe now it, it can automatically uh, do the spontaneous breathing trial. Uh, if you, um, I think you have to click on to the, to do that. I'm, I, we don't have that ventilator, so I'm not sure, but I, I know it weans it down, and it'll at least let the clinician know. The problem is that the way it weans it down is that the slow pressure support wean. So um, there is no technology right now that will go from uh, a preset amount, um, you know, pressure support of 14, and then look for uh, liberation potential at present. That could be something that would happen in the future. The closest is the smart care where it actually will do a, a take you down, alert the clinician, and maybe do a spontaneous breathing trial automatically. Um, I just, the doing the spontaneous breathing trial automatically without the clinician present makes me a little nervous because I like to see my patients when they're uh, breathing spontaneously and see how they look because they'll look, usually let you know, um, you know, long before they, you know, blood gases or some of the hemodynamics just by looking at them. So uh, we're not there. To get to the question, we're not there. Uh, we're kind of halfway there. Okay. Thank you. So, Sean, a question is uh, from Chris. Are laboratory results and other EMR data pushed to the telehealth uh, proactively, or do they typically just have access to the EMR in a remote center, meaning they're getting alerts and things? Yeah, so they have access within the remote center, but it's um, kind of organized uh, through a platform, so it's not like they have to uh, kind of go into you know 20 different EMRs they have access to be able to get into the different EMRs but it's um, the software you know they have more intelligent software that helps coordinate that information and lab work and it also helps um, intelligent software that really shows you know with a physician they're not going to be just looking at 
you know, 80 patients on the screen. There might be all that information and data uh, streaming, but there's, you know, color-coded indicators to really show that hey, these seven or eight patients are really doing, you know, you know, really bad. Those are the ones we're going to pay, you know, a lot more attention, just like you would in person. You know, in your ICU, you always know when you get shift report, you know, this is the per patient that's, that's not doing so well. Uh, it's, it's a very similar fashion in the tele-ICU operation center. Okay. Thank you. Another question for Sean from Christine is, do you see telehealth becoming an option for HME, DME companies with RTs? Uh, absolutely, potentially. I think there's a lot of stuff in regards to getting into the home. Um, you know, we, we've talked about uh, things with, uh, look at the pediatric population of, you know, patients that get on vents and stay within the hospital system. Um, but probably could be discharged on a home vent and having connections with home care, um, but making sure that, you know, a respiratory therapist is doing, you know, daily checks using video conferencing technology uh, to assess the patients. Uh, and we talked about like COPD patients. There's, there's a huge opportunity of, you know, I think, you know, the future of respiratory therapy is really, you know, it's, it's not just, uh, you know, doing NEBS and everything else. It's our expertise. It's our knowledge of, of the respiratory system and how we can use that knowledge um, and leverage the technology to, to take better care of our patients. All right, thank you uh, both gentlemen. Um, unfortunately, uh, to everyone else out there, our time is about up and we are not going to be able to get to the rest of your questions. Uh, I would encourage you to, uh, if you can, uh, you can maybe find John and Sean online and ask them some of these great questions. Um, and I apologize for not having the time to do that. Um, with that, uh, I will thank you for all of your times and, uh, and certainly your interest in this topic. Well, excellent discussion today. I'd like to thank you very much for your time, both John and Sean, and as well to you, Michael, for being our moderator today. It has been such a pleasure working with you. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the live audience today, and as well, those of you in a future time who are attending this recorded session. We thank you for your time and your thoughtful attention. And this does now conclude our session for today. Take care, everyone, and bye for now.